Hello, welcome to the Basketball Soapbox here on Spotify and YouTube. Uh, don't to forget to like, comment, and subscribe. As always, it helps the channel out. Um, but this will be episode six here as we'll be talking about the in-season tournament so far in the NBA. Uh, a lot of skepticism going into it at the start of it, but as we've reached the knockout stages and people kind of get to the simple format, um, we've been getting some entertaining games. Um, we're going to have the finals on Saturday, which is today. I'm filming really early in the morning. Um, but we have the uh, Pacers versus the Lakers in the first ever finals of the NBA Cup in season tournament um, happening here. Two entertaining teams that have been throughout uh, undefeated, uh, have been playing really, really well. Uh, we got the Lakers overcoming the Suns in a highly entertaining game. Um, Kevin Durant and LeBron James going at it 31 apiece, um, <laughs> defeating the Pelicans by 44 um, in the semifinals matchup, which was a letdown. Um, but on the flip side here, we have the Pacers who defeated the Boston Celtics um, and defeated the Milwaukee Bucks, who I'll talk about uh, the Indiana the Pacers right now, especially the Tyrese Halliburton show. Um, this kid has come out and has had doubters pretty much throughout his whole NBA career, you know, coming out of Iowa State, um, getting drafted by the Kings. I actually wanted the Celtics to draft him um, in that 2020 draft there, um, I believe the Kings and the Pelicans were in front of us. Um, the Kings, for the what seems like for the first time in a while, make a great draft pick, drafting Tyrus Halliburton. Um, don't know how to use him. The Pelicans drafted Kara Lewis, I believe, and we drafted Aaron Nays Naismith, who ironically plays with Tyrus Halliburton in Indiana, um, helping eliminate uh, my Boston Celtics there in the first round uh, matchup there at the knockout stages um, a couple of days ago, 122 to 112. Um, but Tyrus Halliburton was out there in Sacramento and people were trying to debate, hey, which direction is this, is this team going with De'Aaron Fox or Tyrus Halliburton? They ended up picking De'Aaron Fox, trading Tyrus Halliburton to Indiana for DeMontis Sabonis. And it was a trade that worked out for both teams because we saw growth with those teams. Um, the Sacramento Kings, of course, being Cinderella uh, last year, making the playoffs, um, having a highly entertaining uh, series against the Golden State Warriors there in the first round. Um, on the flip side, we had the Indiana Pacers who looked like they were struggling at first. And I think a lot of people forget the Indiana Pacers were the fourth seed in the NBA last season before Tyrus Halliburton went down. And then when he went down, they got all the way out of the playoff race, wasn't really in it. And we're kind of seeing the effects of that this season, right, where they're trying to play at a faster pace. Uh, we're seeing the elevated play of a lot of people and a lot of stuff happening with uh, Buddy Hill to start the season where he wanted to be traded. He's still on the team. He's playing well for them. Um, this team overall is playing well, um, having eight guys in double figures. And I think that has to do a lot of build with the pace with Rick Carlisle is implementing on this team, and especially the guy who we're about to talk about right now, Tyrus Halliburton, who has been putting on a show um, in this in-season tournament there, has just been killing Um 27.8 points per game, 13.7 assists per game, 5.5 rebounds, 1.8 turnovers per game, which is keeping the turnovers low, and he has had zero in his last two games. Just looking at this kid, um, of course, his trajectory, you know, leaving Sacramento, that whole thing, and people were making fun of him, you know, saying that he was emotional leaving Sacramento because he felt like there was something there, and he felt like he could have built his career there a little bit, and especially being on the West Coast, I'm pretty sure that had a lot to do with it, but um, people were making fun of him about that, laughing at him, saying it's a business, get over it. But people are allowed to be attached to things. Let's just start there. But um, he was able to come into an Indian and he's been able to find his, his own steps, his own uh, uh, path here to superstardom, it looks like. And this in-season tournament, when it started, I thought, hey, this is going to be good for the small market teams, the, the, the teams that are trying to make a playoff push and stuff like that. And we had the Pelicans, we had the Kings. We had the Knicks, we had the Pacers on the outside, and of course, out of the, the favorites there, the Suns, the Lakers, the Bucks, and the Celtics. But looking at these smaller market teams, I felt like this was an opportunity for them to get some buzz around them, get some uh, good pressure in early playoff games and stuff like that, even though it's not the playoffs, kind of like it, but it's a tournament. Um, but getting some early pressure games to kind of cement themselves, and I think that would have helped the Kings last year. If they had something similar to like that, um, the Indiana Pacers, especially um, who fell out of the playoff race last year, proving themselves so far in this tournament, um, being undefeated. Um, Tyrus Halliburton has just been killing. He's been the main part of that um, in the last two games, uh, 26.5 points per game, 14 assists per game and 8.5 rebounds. 
on 50, 40, I believe, 100 percent splits um, from the free throw line. He has not missed from the free throw line. He's been leading this uh onslaught offensive onslaught all season for Dean and the Pacers. They're not going to play an ounce of defense, but the ability to get timely stops, especially during this uh, uh, end season tournament has benefited them. And they did that against the Celtics where it looked like they were losing control of the game. And then Tyrus Halliburton was able to get loose, Buddy Hill was able to get loose. Aaron, Aaron Naismith was able to get loose and just knock down some shots during down the stretch there that just gave them the separation against the Celtics. And they turn around go up against the Milwaukee Bucks and do the same thing, led by Tyrus Halliburton. They didn't shoot the ball particularly well from three-point range, but um, just getting in there and attacking the paint, which I'll talk about with the Milwaukee Bucks later on, um, and just getting in the paint and continuing to get shots, continuing to knock down uh, uh, paint touches, beating them in transition. And this pace, I said, I, I, I was talking to people and they were laughing when I said they beat the Celtics and they thought I was just making excuses. But that style of play for the Indian the Pacers, playing at that high pace, kind of reminds me of the Phoenix Suns. And Steve Nash, and there's a lot of similarities between Steve Nash and Tyrus Halliburton, how they just continuously move the ball, play at this fast pace, um, beat the defense before it's even able to set up, especially in transition and off makes and misses and stuff like that. Um, very similar. And I said, do I think the Indian the Pacers are going to win a seven-game series against the – Celtics or the Bucks? No, I don't think so. But on a, any given night where they're not at their A game or anything like that, or they can get you in those type of games because of just the pace and the possessions that they're going to get. And the efficiency of their offense is the thing that's going to make the difference because they're always going to get most likely, especially with Tyrus Halliburton leading the charge, are going to get a good shot. And that's been evidence the past two games, even in late in games where he's beating guys off the dribble and he's able to – uh, implement that style and credit to Rick Carlisle for entrusting Tyrus Halliburton, giving the keys, to, uh, uh, keys to the car and really leading this team. And I think it's different where we saw in Dallas with Rick Carlisle, where it was a lot slower pace a little bit there and playing with a Luka Doncic who has the ball in his hands a lot, really facilitating throughout, uh, uh, his own dribble and really not getting initiating the offense early just the different pace. And I think that's the difference with Rick Carlisle right now versus what he has in Dallas, what we see with Luka Doncic and what we saw with Harden um, in certain situations where he's just dribbling the air out the ball. Um, Tyrus Halliburton gets the ball out of his hands early. He's making the reads early. He understands the game. Um, he's playing really well. And you just have to give kudos to this kid who has developed his game over her, the course of his short career. He's earned himself a max contract. Looks like he's getting his feet settled in Indiana. And this guy has just been killing, has just been killing. And you can watch a bunch of interviews with him and just see his IQ jump off the page. Um, he talks to J.J. Redick, talks to a bunch of guys, and he understands the game as a pure point guard. Like, whereas in what I said, I, 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 people were looking at me and when I was comparing him to Steve Nash, and people were like, I don't think, I don't think he's that level yet. And I'm like, this guy is taller. He plays faster. He has a little bit more athleticism. And he's shooting the ball efficiently. And I think that's something that people are a little taken aback by about how good this guy is this early. And it's like, no, we we see this. This is the right way to play basketball. This is the right way you want a point guard to lead a team in this way. To have eight guys in double figures and mainly coming from him and his, his creation on the offensive end, you have to give respect to that. You have to give respect to Tyrus Halliburton. He's killing it right now. Um, and I can't wait to see what he does against the Lakers. And if Tyrus Halliburton can continue this to knock off Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, who have been to the finals, to knock off Damian Lillard, who has been a leader of a franchise, playoff team, got into a Western Conference finals, to beat Giannis, who was NBA champion, this Bucks team that was recently NBA champion a couple of years ago, and then turn around and then try to beat Anthony Davis and LeBron James. That's a hell of a run, even if it's a in-season tournament. <laughs> if you did that in a week in the NBA, I think that's pretty good, <laughs> even if it was a regular season game. Uh, but let's get on to the other side of things in the Western Conference there where we saw 
LeBron James and Anthony Davis lead the Lakers to the uh, NBA Cup from the Western Conference there, uh, beating the Suns in the first round, as I mentioned earlier, against uh, Kevin Durant and Devin Booker in a controversial call at the end of that game, uh, which didn't sit right with a lot of people. But according to the NBA, Austin Reeves did have the ball (laughs) close to his thigh, and apparently that is possession, which I don't understand but it is what it is and then they go up against the pelicans who i'll talk about especially with zion in my next segment but uh who just lay did <laughs> the other night and just didn't give two shits about this game um brandon ingram and zion williamson laughing when they were asked what uh what are they going to do if they win this nba in-season tournament and maybe they just thought it was hey it's not that big of a deal but the way they played it was like they just needed a vacation and they saw it as a vacation in Vegas. They get, what, three days off? And they play again on Monday. <laughs> so they get a weekend in Vegas. I guess that's the the, the, the good thing for the Pelicans, right? Um, but looking at it from L.A. side, let's just talk about LeBron James, whose impressive play continues. Um, the in-season tournament stats, 26.8 points per game, 8.2 assists per game, 7.5 rebounds. The LeBron line, 25-7-7. He's bumped it up a little bit here in this tournament so far and has been shooting the ball really well. I believe he's shooting 60% from three ball. Um, But just looking at what LeBron James is doing, about to turn 39, and continuously leading this Los Angeles Lakers team the way he is at this stage of his career, is just remarkable, and it's something that we have to always take a step back. Yeah, it's not the playoffs. Yeah, it's not high intent. It's not high leverage basketball and stuff like that, where games matter, where it's life and death, and they have to win this game or whatever the case may be. Yes, it's a tournament, but just to see these spurts from LeBron James and see this consistency. Um, at times it looked like he's tired. He's not going to be in it, especially starting the season and stuff like that. But then seeing him reach this another gear and this in-season tournament, people have laughed, has been made for LeBron um, uh, to, to win an in-season tournament and just usher in something like that. Obviously, this can, this tournament has sparked his competitiveness. You can see a different level of play from LeBron James that we usually see in the playoffs. And I think in that Pelicans game, well, let's even go back to the Suns game where he just took over late and really just put his stamp on the game and said, hey, I can still control the game. Even at this stage of my career, 21st season, almost age 39, goes up against the Pelicans and he kind of just puts his stamp on that game towards the second quarter. I believe he hit three threes in a row, especially one from that midcourt one that's on that's going viral. In sensing the moment, hey, we can take over this game and put these guys away. And his ability to do that and sense, hey, the Pelicans are laying down, let's pour it on them. And that's what the Lakers did (laughs) in route to a 44-point win, which is crazy to me. Um, But, yeah, just looking at LeBron James, his level of excellence, his continuous level of play, and for him to just continue to keep going against all these guys. Kevin Durant is his counterpart in this In his career, right? Like Kevin Durant and him have been battling each other their whole careers. So looking at it from that standpoint, him able to win that battle so far. Turn around, look at Zion and Brandon Ingram. Hey, like you guys are the young pups still. You guys still got a lot to learn and we're going to put you away. To do that is just impressive. He's continuously just keeping that bar, that bar, that excellence, raising the bar of excellence, just continuing to do it um, for the Los Angeles Lakers. And for him to step up at this stage, which is questionable, um, you think at some point he's going to run out of gas, right? Like playing at this level of pace, um, doing it so early in the season, you figure at some point it's going to catch back up with them. At some point. And maybe this is a way – through this in-season tournament, you see impressive play from Cam Riddish. You see impressive play from uh, uh, Austin Reeves. Anthony Davis seems to have a, a, a pulse again. <laughs> so he's getting some rejuvenation out of this Lakers team that we thought was dead. 
a couple weeks ago. And this in-season tournament maybe is a way to kind of revitalize his team. And he's been able to do that so far. Um, we'll see what that happens with the Pacers because um, it's going to be interesting. Uh, contrasting his styles, guys that control the ball there, Tyrese Halliburton and LeBron James. Um, big guys like Anthony Davis and Miles Turner. Miles Turner has been playing great. Anthony Davis has been playing great. So all these things are happening in the end season tournament, and it looks like it's going to come to a head here um, with the Lakers and the Pacers on Saturday. Um, it's going to be impressive. I'm going to love. I'm, I'm going to be watching that game. Um, probably do a follow up as well. Um, just in, just just impressed by all these guys playing really hard and everyone who crucified this in season tournament is getting good play out of the stars, We're creating superstars, getting great play out of the stars there, um, and it's going to be good. Uh, let's move on to Zion Williamson. Zion Williamson, have we seen the best of Zion Williamson? And the numbers are there for Zion. I believe he's averaging 22 points per game. I believe six rebounds, shooting close to 60% on the season. And what I saw in that in-season tournament game against the Los Angeles Lakers, the New Orleans Pelicans, um, is just a letdown. Not just from him. Yep, the whole team played bad. Brandon Ingram, CJ McCollum included. It looked like they just weren't ready. And all day in the media, Shaq and Charles Ball, Charles Barkley's picked the Pelicans to win so in Vegas. So everyone went against went against them and picked the Lakers. But um he was stating how he felt like those guys were the younger team, how they're gonna have fresh legs, and they're just gonna be more athletic and just be game for the Lakers. And Shaq was saying he needs to see these performances from Zion and Brandon Ingram, see them step up against the Lakers and stuff like that. And it paired like Shaq was right. We haven't gotten these performances where they're supposed to step up against these teams and beat them. And a lot of that has to do with Zion Williamson. Now there's a whole lot of, uh, I guess, controversy about how Zion is being used, of course, being a point forward and people saying he should be finishing around the basket. I agree with that. Do I think that he has those point guard skills in terms of handling and passing? Yes, he does. But the best thing he's able to do is finish at the basket, attack the basket. And he's been angry about how he's being used. And the only thing I can come up with is that Zion is going about this the wrong way. You would constantly attack in the basket, getting hurt, things of that nature, being explosive like that is who you are. But when you're out there looking like Eddie Lacy, who ran for the Green Bay Packers, looking big as hell, not having that mobility, not looking like how you did in your offseason photos where you look like you were in shape, look like you were ready at the start of the season. We're now, what, two months into the season, quarter way into the season? And you look like you're back out of shape. And everyone has been saying on TV, from Shaq, Charles Barkley, who's had this issue, um, Stephen A. Smith, multiple personalities on TV have said, yo, man, you got to get in shape. That's the only way you're going to stay healthy. That's the only way you're going to be impactful. That's the only way that you're going to lead this team that need desperately needs you. And that has been the problem since Duke. Right. Like that's been the problem since college. And the Pelicans have committed a lot of money to Zion Williamson, even with a weight clause in his contract. And it seems to just fall on deaf ears. And that's alarming because it's nothing that's on the court that should affect Zion because he's going to be efficient. He's going to get to the basket. He's going to be a monster in that regard. But it seems like everything that happens off the court seems to be an issue. The offseason issues with uh, baby mamas and and triple X stars and stuff like that. The issues with dieting, conditioning. We thought that was going to be a wake up call for him. And it seems to just turn around and be the same crap. Now, is there a reason why they're asking him to play point forward? Maybe not be as aggressive going to the basket and stuff like that. Maybe they're watching his injuries. Maybe that's the one thing that I can look at and be like, maybe they're looking at his injuries like that. 
And that can be rightfully so, as I have scrolled across at the bottom of the game. He's played 133 games out of 410 possible games. That is one-third of his career that he has been playing. The other two-thirds, he's been injured. So I can understand there's hesitance to put him in those aggressive spots on the court, battling underneath, um, using his physicality, getting in, bumping and moving people out the way. That's who he is. And maybe they're trying to save him for the long haul and try to find a different role for him to not be in those situations. But Zion's injury history is a problem, and that has a part to do with him not being in shape. His best season was the 2021 season where he averaged 27 points per game on 60% shooting and was just a monster. The next season he got hurt, didn't play the whole season, came back and scored 26 points in 29 games. So there's there's everything there with a superstar with Zion in terms of his efficiency, in terms of his star power, in terms of his power. In terms of his play style, everything there speaks superstar on the rise. But his injuries, his conditioning has been able to keep him off the court. And one thing that comes to one guy that really comes to mind, especially during my era as a young kid and stuff like that, watching basketball, is Sean Kemp. And now these are two completely different things. Sean Kemp had substance abuse issues, um, eating issues and stuff like that, um, got traded to Cleveland and just got big. And before you know it, in a couple of years, he was out the league and. I'm not I'm not. Of course, he doesn't Zion doesn't have a drug problem or anything. He has a conditioning eating problem right now, whatever the case may be, a health issue, diet issue. And we've seen people just be out of the league for these issues, right? Like being heavy, getting hurt. And yes, he's gotten the contract. But at the same time. Like, I, I just think from the Zion's perspective, where you think about what he said last season, especially with the Suns. When he did that 360 windmill dunk and everyone was mad and stuff like that on the Suns. And he was like, hey, these guys knocked my team out the playoffs last year. And you think with that type of message and that type of thought process from him that there would be a little bit more onus on leading this team. And he has failed to do that. Now, people have said that they brought C.J. McCollum and J.J. Redick in to kind of try to guide him through these waters. And it's like, that hasn't worked. Um, they've been trying to get him on the diet and conditioning. That hasn't worked and it's falling on deaf ears. And I'm just looking at Zion like, man, you have a chance here to lead a franchise. One, not many guys have the chance to do that in the NBA. That's just what it is. And from that standpoint of his comments last season saying, how the Suns eliminated his team from the playoffs the last year and stuff like that, and he wants to be involved in all this stuff. The only way that happens is if you're in shape. The only way that happens is if you're engaged. The only way that happens is if you're in shape. That's just the nature of the beast. And to think of Zion being in those limelights of Sean Kemp and stuff like that and all these off-the-court things playing a role in how you play and how you lead your team, that's unfortunate because you're he's one of the best young stars in the NBA. He's gotten the max dollars. And you feel at this point he should be in those conversations of where Tyrus Halliburton is. And looking at the game where LeBron James outplayed you, that was supposed to be a moment of matching up and saying, hey, LeBron, I'm in the house too, like you guys did a couple of years ago, I believe, um, when they had that great back and forth in that game. And you just figure you just feel like this was a moment lost that should have been bigger than what it was. And maybe the Pelicans didn't take it seriously. Maybe they just was like, hey, we're just going to pack it in. Um, but looking at it from that standpoint, it's like, man, come on, man. Zion, we, you can do better than that. And credit to him in the postgame conference. It looked like he was like, I got to be better on both ends. I got to be more aggressive on the offensive end and give my team a chance. And hopefully this is a moment of embarrassment for him. And maybe this is a point where it can be a turning point, light a fire underneath them like, hey, after this playing tournament, we got to step it up and we got to be better. I got to be better as a player. And hopefully that works out with the coaching staff, with Willie Green and stuff like that, Brandon Ingram, C.J. McCollum. Hopefully they're able to figure that out because they were one of the best teams last year, I believe, with Zion. I believe they were one seed at one point. 
And to see them just fall off like that, especially in this Western Conference, which isn't set in stone. Even though the Minnesota Timberwolves and OKC are playing well, the Lakers have been banged up. The Suns have been banged up. Denver just recently got back Jamal Murray and um, I believe Aaron Gordon came back as well. So looking at this Western Conference, which is still open, you can have a significant impact on that just by being in shape. We've seen it. <laughs> like this team is better. They got Murphy. Um, they got Hawkins. They have some young guys that you guys can play behind. You have Brandon Ingram, who's been playing well. C.J. McCollum, who's been playing well. And it's like you guys have a chance here to do something that that city hasn't had. And I think it's just take a little bit more onus, put a little bit more on his shoulders and try to be better for that team because they deserve it. They deserve it, man. Like these, these small market teams deserve it. And hopefully Zion can figure that out down there. Um, moving on to the Milwaukee Bucks dissension here. Um, have really just been up and down. The end season tournament, they've been playing really well. One of the better teams in the league. But there's just been seems a little bit of rumblings there with Giannis and Adrian Griffin, where the head coach, where he had a process in hiring and handpicked and had a say in it. And it looks like there's just a little bit of dissension there. And, of course, looking at the Bucks coming into the season, trading Drew Holiday, getting Damian Lillard, obviously there was going to be a step back in defense. That's just the way it works. That's just the way it is. They don't have guys like P.J. Tucker, Wes Matthews. Chris Middleton has lost a step with his injury and stuff like that. And obviously going from Drew Holiday to Dame is going to affect your defense. That was going to be expected, and I feel like that was going to take some time to figure out. And especially if Giannis off that knee surgery, who just had knee surgeries this offseason. If he's not there defensively, it makes it really difficult for those other guys to pick up that slack, especially with not Drew Holiday leading the point of the attack at the defensive end. So seeing that, I expected that little low. And I wanted to see how their offense was going to be, which is third in the league. They're one of the best field goal percentage uh, teams in the league, efficiency-wise, scoring the basketball. And you feel like Damian Lillard and Giannis, obviously they're still trying to figure each other out after 20 games. Um trying to piece it together, but <laughs> apparently the in-season tournament loss to the Indiana Pacers didn't help. Um, Bobby Porter saying we're just we're not organized. Gianna saying we're not organized. Um, Bobby Porter's calling out Adrian Griffin saying you guys got to be better and put us in a better stretch. When the game is on the line, we got to be in better position. And I believe they're one of the better teams early in the season, but something's there where something's not vibing right. And, and of course, Teams have these type of blow-ups all the time. But the defense for the Milwaukee Bucks has just been bad. And usually they're average, but it's really bad. They're just not looking like they're stopping anybody. Um, teams are getting in the transition, beating them to down the court, and getting a lot of the points in the paint. And you feel like guys like Brooke Lopez and, and, and Giannis, that that wouldn't be happening. But obviously the loss of Drew Holiday, that defensive uh, uh, stalwart on the perimeter, has been hurting them and Dame has been trying to navigate and find his way offensively, which he's kind of been picking up a little bit. But in terms of that defense, I feel like that's the biggest issue for them and their bench as well. So there's two things there that have been a problem for the Milwaukee Bucks and especially all this gripe with Adrian Griffin, who they just brought in. Um, they're, they they got some things to figure out, especially on the defensive end. And, you, and, again, as I said, if Chris Middleton is not up to snuff, especially coming off an injury and doesn't have that mobility on that end, it's going to be really difficult for you guys to – the Milwaukee Bucks to try to get to the finals, in my opinion. Because even though their offense is taking off, you're not your ability, your inability to get stops and having Dane be attacked on the offensive end. You can't hide him, really. It's going to be tough. At one point, I believe they had uh, Malik Beasley trying to guard Halliburton, and that didn't go well. And that's something that they're going to have to look at because, yeah, Pat Connington didn't play, and Drake Jay Crowder has been out for a while. But those guys are probably what they're missing. Those guys that can take a little bit more of the defensive attack there and still be able to provide some type of offense, especially shooting the basketball, 
maybe that's what they've been missing for a while now. And maybe that's what they're waiting for to come back to try to shore up that defense a little bit and get back a little bit to more average. Um, but right now, if Giannis can't lead that defensive charge on that end and hold it down and then affecting everyone around him, it's going to be difficult for the Bucks, especially come playoff time, to try to figure that out um, 22 games into the season. But, yeah, they got some stuff to figure out because especially with the coach there, I know he's a first-year coach and it's been a little difficult. They moved on from Mike Budenhauser, who's more of an offensive stalwart who just didn't make adjustments. Um, looking at it from that standpoint, yeah, the Bucks just got to figure out that defensive side of the ball down. Because that offense they raised, and that's where they were having trouble in the past, especially with Drew Holiday um, not being as efficient in the playoffs. But you definitely feel like that's something that they're going to try to figure out at some point because if that defense is getting attacked there with uh, Damian Lillard, you can't hide him. Like everywhere he's going to be, uh, it's a mismatch for the other team. They're going to try – they're just going to post him up, go at him, attack him, and if he gets in foul trouble, who are you going to go to at that point? So the Bucks have some some problems they got to figure out at some point. At some point. Um, but that will do it for this episode of the Basketball Soapbox. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, we're going to be looking at the end season tournament, of course, with the Pacers and Lakers. We're going to see the fallout of that. Um, Ring takes is going to be picking back up with Brian and Lewis, of course. Uh, Looking at Randy Orton signing and CM Punk coming back, and we're going to be talking about that in, in volume this week. Um, so uh, check that out. It uh, should be up on Wednesday. We're going to be talking about it on Tuesday. But uh, thank you guys for joining me. We're going to be looking at the in-season tournament, keep moving down this road of the NBA season. And until next time, thank you for joining me.